up our eyes, you're the giver of life. Now, in our story today, we're going to find out about someone who did indeed do that. They lifted up their eyes to heaven and found the life that was theirs for them in God. Um, we're in a series at the moment, uh, as, as we said, uh, called When Kingdoms Collide, looking at uh, the, the story of Daniel and the various characters in that. And uh, we're in chapter four today. Uh, Steve's going to come and read it to us. Uh, Daniel chapter four. Uh, We've called it Humbled and Restored. (coughs) Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen, along with its interpretation. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, An angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it. In the new grass of the field, And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation, inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, My lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you saw which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, 
and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King, that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven <coughs> and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Thanks, Steve. Keep your Bibles open, or keep your phones on, uh, for, for, for the Bible passage. Let me just pray. Lord, um, thank you that uh, you're continually speaking to us. Thank you that your Spirit is always at work, and so we're just trusting and praying that you would pinpoint those things that are really relevant to us today. Uh, what is it that you want to do in our lives? How do you want to grow us as a church? What do you want to say to us as individuals? Please help us to hear, not just with our ears, but with our hearts, um, that we might respond by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, I wonder, I wonder what, um, what is your story of coming to faith in Jesus? We've all got different stories, haven't we? Different journeys 
in coming to know and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you can, maybe you can pinpoint the day. Maybe you know and you remember the exact circumstances and you know the moment when you put your trust in Jesus Christ and that, that was such a significant point, um, that, that precise circumstance in that day. Or maybe for you, um, it wasn't quite like that, but it was a gradual process. You, you over a period of time, you began to um, either become aware of or be sure of who Jesus is and what he'd done for you so that you could look back and say, yes, I know I know that I'm saved, I know that I belong to Jesus, but there's not an exact moment that I remember turning to him. And I became a Christian when I was a child. Um, in human terms, not dramatic, but the point is that every single one of us has a story which is significant because it's a heart that's been changed by Jesus. Um, and I encourage you today, you know, as you listen to this, um, try and pinpoint where you are on your journey of faith. For some of us here, we may not yet have put our trust in Christ. We may be still on that journey towards coming to know him. And for others of us, we are, maybe for years. But what is it that God wants to say to us in our faith journey right now? What's really, really important, of course, in, um, in turning to Christ is, is we must remember that we should not regard becoming a Christian as like an add-on to the rest of life, a bit of a bolt-on, an extra, right? Uh, because being a Christian is not simply um, agreeing with a set of beliefs about who God is. Knowing Jesus is not um, uh, just another relationship to add to the other friendships that I have. Coming to church is not another activity amongst the many other things that I do in my life. So it's not an add-on, is it? No. Listen to what Jesus said, some of his words, about what it means to become a Christian. Jesus said that anyone who trusts in, the, in his saving work on the cross has literally crossed over from death to life. It's the contrast between death and life. He later on told a parable, didn't he, um, about a son who was forgiven. Um, he'd walked away from his father, taken everything that he thought he was owed, messed things up. And then when he returned to the father, and the father was there with outstretched arms to welcome him home, um, Jesus describes in the parable how the father said to the household, he said, my son was dead but is alive again. He is lost but now he was found. You know, it's an image, isn't it, of the, res the restoration that we have with our heavenly father as we return to him, as we trust in Jesus' death on the cross. And Jesus, looking around um, at the effect of sin in the world and in our lives, Jesus said that whoever follows me, he said, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Can you see those contrasts? They are incredible contrasts, aren't they? Death to life, lost and found, darkness and light. That's the difference between not being a Christian and then coming to know Jesus and being saved. It's a huge, huge thing. So an incredible change happens to us when we come to Jesus Christ. There's other ways that the Bible describes what's happened. Psalm 103, and the psalmist writes, as far, as far as the east, I'm going to get it wrong now, and I have to look around. Which way is east, everyone? East side, that's the east side. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Can you believe it? Our sins are gone in God's sight. We still sin, but the effects and the, the punishment for sin are gone when we trust in Jesus. That is the amazing change. So what happens in us? The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. I cannot overstate it today, the contrast between pre-Christianity in your life, yeah, before you knew Jesus, and the change that happens when you come to know him through the cross. And that sets up where we're going today. Look, our series is called When Kingdoms Collide. We're thinking about this, this huge contrast between, and this clash between earthly rulers with all the might and the power that they believe they have and they exercise and rule. You think about that going on in the world today, right? All of that, and going back thousands of years into the story of Daniel. The contrast between earthly kings and rulers with limited power, temporal kingdoms, and the true God who has all authority, all power, all dominion, whose kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. 
question is, of course, when we go into this series, is whose kingdom are you part of? <laughs> Which is the king you're trusting in? Where is your hope and your confidence? Where does it lie? And whilst we are, when we think about the characters in the book, whilst we are daring to be a Daniel, <laughs> taking a stand for Jesus, whilst we are taking inspiration from Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in, in wanting to be faithful to God despite the pressures and the, the persecutions, the difficulties that they faced, we've also been getting an insight into King Nebuchadnezzar and his life and his faith journey. Um, I don't know about you, uh, it's, same for me. It's very, very tempting when we, uh, when we read Bible stories. We, we tend to want to put ourselves into the shoes of the most godly ones in the stories, don't we? We look at the characters and we, we want to align ourselves with the ones that seem most faithful to God. It's much harder and more painful for us to look for the traits of the villain in our lives. But it's really important that we, we, we do that because God has got something to say to us through all the characters in the stories. What is it that he wants to show us? Because Today, we cannot ignore the person who is front and center in this story. We've seen some of his experiences of God in the first three chapters, but today, Nebuchadnezzar is at the center of this story, and we see what God has incredibly done uh, by transforming this powerful and menacing king into someone who submits his life to the true and living God. And what does it say to us um, in our lives? Well, there's a fundamental truth that underpins our story today. Um, you look at the very, very last line in that chapter where Nebuchadnezzar there, uh, as he acknowledges God, we read, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. See, there's a, this emphasis is, is repeated throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, it says, the Lord sends poverty and wealth he humbles and he exalts. Jesus, in, in his life on earth, uh, uh, um, emphasized this and um, uh, mentioned it more than once. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled by God. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then later on, James, in his letter, um, uh, referencing the book of Proverbs, says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Can you see pride and humility? But what God does with that, how he responds to that, how he reverses that in his kingdom. And the thing is, as we see uh, and look at what God did in Nebuchadnezzar's life, the story is strongly, strongly asking us these questions. One, where is pride in your life? Where is pride in my life? And, and specifically, where, where is our pride resisting God and God's work that he wants to do? Secondly, um, how has God intervened and humbled you in your life? Think back to times where he may have done that. And thirdly, what change has taken place in your life as a result? Specifically, the result of coming to know Jesus and the transformation that he has made. Well, from the start of this story we see this transformation in the king. Look at, look at where he starts in the story. Um, uh, king Nebuchadnezzar addresses the nations and the peoples of every language who live in all the earth. It's a significant uh, uh, thing that uh, we see in this story, King Nebuchadnezzar speaking in the first person. I think I'm right. He's the only non-Jew to speak in the first person recorded in Scripture. So something very significant is happening and God wants to, 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 to point this out to us. But do you remember the herald of King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 that we read a couple of weeks ago? Um, the herald was that com he commanded the nations and the people of every language and, uh, and, and tribe and nation uh, to bow down to the statue that he had made. Uh, the, 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 the words just mirror each other. The music was played and People had to bow down to his statue or else they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. It was like forcing worship, wasn't it? But now the, the king's tone, or, or maybe his tune, has changed completely. Rather than imposing worship uh, upon people because he wanted the focus, no, his focus was on what was good for people because he wanted them to look to God. He said, may you prosper greatly. He wanted the best for the nations and the peoples around the world. 
He exalted God now and not himself. So we see. It's my pleasure, he says, to, to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. That little phrase, um, signs and wonders, uh, predominantly in the Old Testament, where that phrase is used, it's used to refer back to the signs and wonders of God in uh, rescuing his people from slavery in Egypt and rescuing them out of there into the promised land. And so when, when King Nebuchadnezzar is using that phrase, signs and wonders, you know, it should hark back to a great rescue of God for his people, but also it signifies a great rescue that's taken place in his own life, that God has done a great thing in his heart and transformed him completely. And this is the excitement of a man who is shouting from the rooftops. He wants to tell everyone about what God has done in his life. And it should spark us to think for ourselves, when have you been so excited about your faith in Jesus that you just wanted everyone to hear? Have there been times where it just struck you, either, either you know, um, early on when you were saved and it was just the most amazing thing to know Jesus? You just wanted everyone to know. Or maybe God refreshed you and just excited you about the grace of the gospel again and you just were sparked to tell people about Jesus. You, you didn't want to hide it. I wonder what those times were for you. Um, maybe, maybe for you, you can also think of the times where that's faded. That passion for Jesus has faded and you, you haven't been motivated to share. Maybe you've been ashamed or you've been, been conscious of standing out in the crowd and you haven't wanted to tell people, wanted to blend in. It's been too difficult. Or maybe you've been criticised and then wanted to hide for a bit. Or maybe you've just been discouraged. I wonder where you are right now. I wonder if... God did reignite a joy and a passion. And what did that? What was the change? How can we help each other to be excited about Jesus so that actually what the words of the king there are just, just are evident in our lives to say, look what God has done for me and what Jesus has done in my life. I want to tell you. I want you to share in that. Well, as we get into the story, there's two headings based on this contrast. The first one is this, God humbles the proud. It's, the, it's the, the, the major part of the story, actually, from verses 4 to 33. We see ne King Nebuchadnezzar giving his testimony of faith, the story of his conversion. And it starts like this in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. This was a self-made man. This was a man who was happy with his success um, he did, of course, believe in the gods, didn't he? We, we know that from the last few chapters. He believed in the Babylonian gods, but we also got that impression that they weren't very relatable. They were distant and remote. They couldn't be counted on to answer prayers or to reveal things uh, when, when, when the people called out. So there was a belief in God, but not a relationship with God where he could be sure and content um, with his relationship with him. And the thing is, for Nebuchadnezzar, as with many people, it's not until the foundations of our lives are shaken that we actually start to consider God because we just settle into life and we're, we're happy just doing our thing. Something changes to cause us to be unsettled. Um, and this is what happened here where crisis happened for Nebuchadnezzar. He said, I had a dream that made me afraid. I was lying in bed and the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Had a disturbing dream before, hadn't he? <laughs> but managed to get on with life again. But here he is, he's terrified, he's, he's disturbed. Chris and I, we, we were chatting a few weeks ago, weren't we, Chris, about how so many people um, don't really think about God until crisis happens. And, uh, you know, maybe God had been reaching out for years, hinting and trying to get, catch our attention. We don't listen until God has to shout loudly for us to hear. And he can use crisis to bring us to him. Maybe he's done that for you. Maybe something difficult happened and it caused you to respond to God at last, even through the trauma of the pain. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar's old habits continued for now because he called for his wise men to interpret the dream. Of course, they were unable to do so. 
become a pattern, doesn't it, through the story? Why did he keep calling on these guys? Obviously, they had some wisdom, some sort of power, but he kept turning to them rather than turning to Daniel and already proved himself to be able to interpret dreams. God had given him a specific gift for moments like this. The king's old habits were still in play. The thing is, probably because there was this spiritual battle of his soul. A spiritual battle because... Um, God was working and, and revealing himself and showing himself, but, but at the moment he was still battling to recognise who the true God was. And I think that's emphasised by when Daniel is called in. You see this, um, see this little statement here. Daniel, particularly in this chapter, is referred to by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar, after the name of my God and the spirits of the holy gods is in him. The king is recognizing that Daniel has some power and, and believes it's from the gods, but he doesn't yet recognize or acknowledge who the true God is, who is the source of this power. He says, no mystery is too difficult for you, Daniel. He knows Daniel has something, but he hasn't yet submitted his life to the true God. I wonder um, if you remember a time before you were a Christian where there seemed to be a bit of a battle going on in your soul. Which way were you going to turn? God was drawing you. God was revealing himself. God was showing himself to you. And you, you were starting to acknowledge him, but you weren't yet ready to give your life over to him. You were still trying to hold on to the things that you knew, your old idols, your old gods, the functional gods in your life that gave you comfort or you turned to for answers. It's a big, big thing, isn't it? To surrender your life and to say no. I'm not going to rely on those things anymore. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. He's going to be my king. There was a battle going on in this king's soul. But I think one of the things that this story shows us is how patient God was with Nebuchadnezzar. We've seen it over these few chapters, over a number of years that these events would have taken place, how patient God was in working in Nebuchadnezzar's life until the point when he finally surrendered. Look, chapter one. Do you remember this, where God was at work? Nebuchadnezzar could see God at work through Daniel and his friends. As they decided, uh, Daniel decided not to defile himself with the king's royal food, um, but God upheld him and sustained them. King Nebuchadnezzar could see that. He also experienced in chapter two, God, the God who reveals mysteries, as God revealed through Daniel the meaning of this particular dream. Uh, God was showing himself more and more. And, and uh, last chapter, chapter 3, uh, the king was in, in awe of a God who could rescue and protect his people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the fire. They were faithful to God, and God was faithful to them in the fire and rescued and protect them. He was patient. God was patient. And isn't God so patient with us? <laughs> you see that over your life? been times where God has just been so patient with you, giving you time to respond to him. Sometimes just giving you a tap, sometimes a conviction in your heart, sometimes even giving you the pain of a crisis, but has allowed you that space and time to turn to him, maybe to turn to him to actually give your life to Jesus for the first time, but other times as well, where God has said, I'm at work, <laughs> but I'm just going to keep going with you. Doesn't that just show you the, the goodness of God and how he just is faithful to you throughout your life? Does, I wonder if there's people that you would love to turn to Jesus right now and you've been, been praying for them for years and been frustrated. Why haven't they come yet? It's so obvious, it's so clear God is at work. God is real, Jesus is alive. And yet they haven't yet turned. Would this story of King Nebuchadnezzar maybe not just stop our urgency in praying, but also give us a heart of God for patience that he will do the right thing at the right time, just as he's done in our lives as well. For many years, um, C.S. Lewis, who you, know, you might know as the writer of the Narnia stories, but he's also written lots of theology books to, to help people to grow in their faith. He describes that over many, many years, God was working away at his life, continuing to sort of um, draw, him, draw him to him, but he resisted him, he resisted him. He didn't want to submit to God. He wanted to, 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 to keep God at arm's length until the point where C.S. Lewis finally, finally gave in and he knelt down and prayed. He, he recognized in his own words, he said, God, he recognized that God was God 
and he knelt to pray and turned to Jesus. It can happen in anyone, however long we might resist. But whatever form it takes, whatever form it takes, and our, all of our stories are different, there has to be a humbling process in our lives for us to come to Christ. Why? Because we finally have to surrender and give up um, wanting to be in charge. <laughs> we have to give up wanting to be our own king. And we have to recognize that Jesus is the king and turn to him. And this is how it happened in King Nebuchadnezzar's story. Look at the dream and its fulfillment. Um, uh, I'm just going to read it again from verses 10 to 16. And the image is on the screen there. He says, I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while, I, while lying in bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him was the dream that the king had Daniel was troubled <laughs> because he knew he knew once God had revealed it to him he knew this was a, a message for the king he knew that, that, that God had to humble Nebuchadnezzar to to basically remove his pride before the good work was done he he had to acknowledge the king had to acknowledge that verse 17 the most high is the sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. So when Daniel finally plucks up the courage and the conviction to say um, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, your majesty, you are that tree. You're the tree that God has given power and authority to rule. Do you remember this from the dream in chapter 2? There was an affirmation, actually, that God had given Nebuchadnezzar that particular role to be a king and to, to have some power and authority, but it had to be done and to exercise under God because God is the king over all. And the problem is, is that Nebuchadnezzar had lived in pride. He lived for himself. He wanted everyone to bow and worship him, not to point to God. And so he would be driven away from people and would live with the wild animals for seven times, could be years, Seven, of course, indicates a perfect period of time. So however long it was, it was the time that God had allotted for him until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. He'd be humbled. He would effectively go mad and live with the animals. You know, the, in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar was given power and authority to bless others, to serve others, to provide for as is symbolized in the dream, the animals and the creatures, all the peoples. But now, he would become like an animal, like a wild animal, lost his mind, humbled so much from, from the heights to the depths until he acknowledged who God was. And this is exactly what happened. But Daniel said to him, here's my advice, listen carefully. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. You know, the stump of the tree would be left. I've missed out something there. The stump, of the stump of the tree would be left, showing that restoration would be possible for Nebuchadnezzar if he returned and acknowledged God's rule. This was mercy. Now, our trees just out, out the back of, um, on the west side of the, the church there have been causing havoc and, and growing so large and so big that they were uh, causing problems for us, so we had to have them chopped down. But already you might have seen, there's a picture of them here, that you've got fresh branches that are growing out. There's new life coming out of the stumps that have been left. And so new life grows as God allowed the stump to remain in Nebuchadnezzar's life. There would be possible way for him to grow and to flourish again if he returned. And Daniel said, renounce your sins. Do what is right. 
recognize that your life has been going the wrong way. You've been living against God, so turn back to him. And this is the gospel. This is the good news. The good news is that we can turn back. The problem is we can't do it in our own strength. However much you think there's, there's, there's things wrong in my life and I've got to put them right, how can I live properly? There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to turn, to turn back to God. We can't make ourselves right. That's what the song we sang earlier is all about. Who can save themselves? Who can heal their own soul? It is not possible. It is only possible by the grace and the power of and the purposes of God shown through Jesus Christ. That's why he died on the cross. That's why we lift Jesus up and we say, Jesus is the way. (laughs) It's possible through Jesus to have our sins forgiven, that as we recognize what is not right in our own hearts, where do we turn? We turn to the cross. We say thank you to Jesus. And we recognize that our sins can be (coughs) forgiven and wiped clean. And we live a new life, living God's way now. We're not perfect. We will be one day. Jesus will return. But that's where the glory goes, to God. And it's possible for us, for you. If you don't know Jesus yet, you can turn to him and experience new life today because of the cross. In Nebuchadnezzar's life, it turned out exactly as God had predicted. There he is, 12 months after the dream. (laughs) 12 months later, nothing perhaps had changed in his life. He carried on as normal. And it says, while walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he says, is this not the great, is is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Do you you see how many I's and my's are in there? (laughs) It's all about me still. Maybe the uh, the, the sort of, the, the fright of the dream had passed. Nothing had specifically changed in life and he'd settled back into how things were. The, uh, the city, we've already talked about over these last few weeks, the city of Babylon was a great site. It was a, a mighty, mighty powerful city. The, the, the hanging um, gardens of Babylon, one of the eight, seven ancient wonders of the world. And yet, his pride was still in him. No sooner had this king spoken about what he thought he had done, than a greater voice from heaven declared his fate and it enacted exactly what God had threatened became mad and he was humbled as an animal he might have um, been following the news of various other famous or prominent figures that have been humbled recently from their lofty positions they're in prison there's various people Boris Becker in prison Ted Hankey, that is the darts player, one, former world champion darts player, in prison, sexual assault. Boris Becker, declared bankrupt but hiding assets. This uh, MP, um, what's his name here? Imran Ahmed Khan, in prison, sexual offences. Prominent positions, humbled. I don't know, sometimes you can put famous people on pedestals, can't we? They've got talents, they've got gifts, they're in the public eye. But doesn't this story of King Nebuchadnezzar, this great king, just, just highlight to us again No matter who you are, you could be great or you can be small. Everyone needs Jesus. All of us have pride in our lives that needs to be taken out of us in order for us to be humbled enough to turn to Jesus. It's universal. But here's the last part of the story. We've we've predominantly looked at the humiliation in this sense, but the humbling of the king. But here's the wonderful thing. God exalts the humble. Once this stripping away of pride in our life has taken place, it clears the way for God to build us up again. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. That song we sung earlier, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes. He's the giver of life. Nebuchadnezzar's life was turned around. You've been, sto- you've been following this story of Deborah James, you know, the podcast host, this lady that um, she uh, has had bowel cancer for the last five years um, and um, has raised a lot of awareness for cancer charities, been very vocal about it, raised lots of money, millions of pounds for charities. And then recently, they've now stopped her treatment. She's decided 
stop the treatment. She's just receiving end-of-life care. And what struck me a couple of weeks ago, she, she said something like, now that the end of her life is nearly here, she just wants more time. She just wants more time to spend with the ones that she loves, her family, the ones closest to her. And that line just really struck me as I heard it because I was thinking about this message and I thought, do you know what? Whoever it is, whatever circumstances we face in our lives, God gives us exactly the right amount of time in order to turn to him. One thing you can pray for her is that with the time that God gives her, that she might turn to Jesus. <laughs> Despite all the good that she might have done in her life and all the money she's raised, actually, the time that he's given her now is the time to follow Jesus. I've read another story in response to the Deborah James one by a Christian lady who talks about, um, a few years ago, the story of her husband who contracted bowel cancer, same same disease, bowel cancer. And at that moment in time, neither her and her husband had ever really considered God before, never considered Jesus. And it was through that time of, of being ill that they cried out to God together. And Jesus met them. Jesus met them, and her husband and her both became Christians through that crisis where God brought them low. He brought them to him. And eventually her husband actually died not, so, not, not too long later, died. And uh, uh, the thing is, when I think about this story, um, whilst they were humbled, he was elevated. That man was elevated, exalted by God. And now <laughs> he sits with Jesus at the right hand of God. It's the story of all of our lives. The humbling that takes place can result in exaltation when we meet Jesus and he restores us. King Nebuchadnezzar, after he was humbled and his pride was taken out of him, it was turned to praise. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures for ge from generation to generation. All the peoples on the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one could hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? In chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to, the Jews to assimilate into his culture. But by chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is the one whose complete identity has changed himself as he becomes a child of God. It's, the, it's a reversal of, the, of, the, of the, the plans of his life that he was trying to control, but God's plans prevailed. What a transformation, eh? He was graciously restored by God but now he was going to rule differently. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. He was going to rule differently because he knew God personally. And in case he was tempted to fall back into pride again, he said, those who walk in pride he's able to humble. So once we have a humble heart and we turn to Jesus, God restores us. He restores our relationship with him and he exalts us. We don't, we're not necessarily going to have material wealth in this world. It's not what we're looking for. But how are we exalted? What do we have that we didn't have before? Well, we have a security. We have a security in Christ that we could never have otherwise. We can have a contentment because we found God. We found the one that our hearts need more than anything else. We don't have to have fear anymore. We don't have to have fear of what others think of us. We don't have to have a fear of failure, the things that, that we, we, we worry whether we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. We don't have to have a fear of death because death has been beaten. It's been defeated. We have eternal life. This is our exaltation, folks. The pride that we live in brings us no security at all. But when we're humble before God, he gives us everything and more because we have what we have in him. So let's rejoice. Let's rejoice in this story of how God can transform a life. Let's rejoice in the story of our lives, 
if we know Jesus. Let's rejoice in each other's stories. And if you don't know Jesus, turn to him today. But unless we're content with our past story, if you, were a Christian, if you became a Christian 20 years ago, 30 years ago, great to retell that story. But don't just hang everything on that past story. What is God doing in your life right now? What's the testimony of how Jesus is at work in you right now that you can share and encourage others with by the Spirit who is alive and active? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a God who is at work. Thank you that you brought a humbling into the life of this king. Why? Because you wanted your name to be known and you wanted to restore him so that he would shout from the rooftops about your greatness. Lord, thank you that even though, even though sometimes it's, caused, it's a crisis that's caused us to come to you, thank you that you did it. Thank you that you did it because you took away our pride. You caused us to be humble before you in order to lift up Jesus. Lord, whatever our stories of our journeys of faith, thank you that you are at work to humble us, but also to exalt us in Jesus. And help us to have a confidence to know that our lives are with Christ at the right hand of the Father. We are exalted to the highest place with him. And that we have nothing to fear, but we have everything to enjoy of knowing you. Please, Lord, keep working in us. Bring those of us who don't yet know Jesus to him that we might rejoice too in a life, a new life that can be lived for Christ in this world and the next. So we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.